I am going to focus on the production side. So how to produce a green hydrogen using pyrogasification. This uh, is something that we're very familiar with. So before, I just want to show you a slide about the company S3D Engineering. So S3D Engineering is a design office. It's independent and it's specialized in uh, using waste and uh, focusing on alternative fuels. We were created in February 2017. I was one of the co-founders. I am one of the co-founders and the uh, chairman. So there are 16 people in the company, 14 in Nantes, two in Lyon. And we've got a subsidiary called SCE. You can see that on the right hand side of the slide. So this is a, a general design office with 500 engineers in France uh, and different agencies everywhere, in fact. Anthony, just um, a comment. Can you share your screen so that we can see your presentation? I thought I was sharing my screen, sorry. Ah, so let's just see if we can share the screen. Perfect, thank you. So as I was saying, this diagram on the right hand side, so we've got SCE, so uh, S3D is a subsidiary of SCE, which is a, belongs to Skiran, and there are 500 employees altogether. So S3D, we are pure specialists, as I've said, uh, So, and our field of predilection is methanization. So this has been very dynamic since the creation of S3D in 2017. So we make biogas from waste. So pyrogasification is our speciality. So we use waste to do this. That's wet, a little bit wet. So woody waste. And, uh, and this is something that's advantageous for alternative uh, fuels. So the production of biodiesel, for example, production of hydrogen. And our fourth speciality is strategy and performance. So this is more of a cross-cutting focus. We help companies, we help authorities uh, with energy questions, waste questions, and mobility issues. So this brings me to my presentation. So I'm going to start with a quick introduction to the different ways to produce hydrogen. So Paul has already uh, given us the spoiler. Uh, so I'll go back over some of what he said. We'll talk about the requirements with respect to use. Three, uh, we'll look at producing hydrogen based on gasification. And then I'll talk about the different business models that are being developed today in France. And then I'll draw a conclusion a general conclusion about this sector. So here's the diagram. This is what we wanted to have a look at. So you could need electrolysis, water and electricity, which can be renewable or uh, nuclear based. So most hydrogen is made from natural gas reforming. So from fossil sources or other sources, and then it's possible to make green hydrogen by uh, uh, using biomethane for the reforming processes. And this is what Paul was saying. So on this diagram, you've got all the different ways to make hydrogen. So gr green, gray, blue, if you pick up the CO2 and during the reforming, yellow, if it's just nuclear, no, sorry, no, if it's just nuclear, yellow, if it's the general mix. So it's a bit complex. There are different, there's, the, there's a color coding system and that's why the European Commission is going to change uh, the labels used in the middle of 2021. We'll just talk about clean hydrogen for referring to green hydrogen. So it's low carbon hydrogen and fossil hydrogen that we'll be referring to in the future. So there we go. 
So today, so there are different uh, hydrogen development projects, green hydrogen development projects, uh, and the main focus is on uses. So having the opportunity to inject hydrogen into the natural gas network is, well, it's not yet possible. There's no uh, buyback price for this operation yet, but it's a good uh, idea for reuse. So that's the first uh, constraint. It's expensive. If you compare a diesel vehicle and a hydrogen vehicle, you can see that the hydrogen version often costs the double of a diesel car, so, and the choices are really quite limited. So this is what we can see today. So it's a sector that's, that's really bubbling away, but um, uh, there are limits. So to be able to develop projects for mobility based on hydrogen, we need uh, the commitment of consumers in order to safeguard the project. So industrial consumers, for example, they buy hydrogen at a low cost. And uh, authorities are also beginning to be interested in this. But of course, it's important to have commitments, to have some kind of contract uh, to be able to set up a project. So some examples of consumption in different vehicles with a, a car, a bus and a truck uh, that picks up household waste. So when you can produce a lot of hydrogen on a daily basis, you need the right number of vehicles to use that hydrogen quickly. So this brings me to our speciality. How do we produce hydrogen based on gasification of waste or biomass? Well, it's quite simple, in fact. So gasification is a process that produces syngas, made up of hydrogen, in fact. Mostly, we can obtain 20 to 25 percent of hydrogen, but it also contains pollutants. So the first thing to do is to treat the syngas that is produced and remove any pollutants, so sulfur, chlorine, because these gases can damage uh, what comes later in the system. You can have tar as well, that is a pollutant downstream. So then it's important to enrich the syngas with hydrogen. So we're talking about 20 to 25%. So there are different possibilities for this. So we've developed this. We've got a, a water gate shift, I think he said. So it's based on a catalyzer and a water vapor system. The idea is to react the CO of the syngas and produce hydrogen and CO2. So in this way, we can increase the rate of hydrogen in the syngas and um, allow the sector to be more profitable. Last brick. So we've got to separate the hydrogen from the other gases, CO, CO2. So the residual gases have to be uh, dealt with. So you then extract the hydrogen based on separation. There are different technologies that you can use for this. And once you've separated the hydrogen it's, and it's pure enough, it can be compressed and made available either for injection or uh, for um, vehicles to use. So everything starts with the pyrogasification. So that's the uh, picture that I showed you. So this is a, an outlook of the different uh, technologies for pyrogasification that you can find out there on the market. So you've got alifixa gasogens. So you've got a countercurrent, a double fire system, or you've got a stage-based system as well. These are different technological solutions, but you've got to be care. I'm not going to give you a full explanation of each process, but you've got to be careful. What I want to show you is that there is really a big uh, range of processes, and you've got fluidized beds as well. So these are used to make large volumes of, of syngas. 
So you've got small productions and, and bigger productions. So let's move on to the next slide. So to choose the right technology for your pyrogasification process, of course, you've got to look at different things. You've got to look at the kind of capacity that you have to reuse the biomass and, and the input energy. So you've got to find out where you are on the on the chart to choose your technology. But you've also got to look at other things. You've got to look at the fuel. You've got to look at the humidity rate, uh, grain size distribution, the ash rate, uh, and choose the technology that is in line with these different parameters. Finally, if you are aiming to produce hydrogen that is pure, or you want to produce hydrogen, but also syn biomethane, well, then it's better to use oxygen based systems so that you're not introducing any nitrogen, especially that's especially important for the biomethane that you make. So, uh, you know, this is, you know, how to choose the first brick, and it's quite complex. Now, here are the different business models that are being developed in France. So you have uh, projects working on sawmill residue, so sawdust, for example. It's easy to uh, transform sawdust into pellets. There are also projects working on uh, forest wood chips, so they retrieve uh, anything from uh, woods that have been uh, cleared. So they pick up uh, the extra wood. So anything that's been cleared uh, leaves behind it this kind of wood. And a last possibility that is being developed currently is based on using uh, plants and introducing these as a fuel to produce hydrogen. And this notably concerns hemp. And uh, there'll be a description of this a little bit later on. There are also many projects focusing on making hydrogen based on waste. So wood waste, for example. So industrial wood waste, but also solid recovered waste. So that's usually a mix of plastics, but also board and wood. So that's the photo bottom right. So the choice of uh, fuel is going to have an effect uh, on the project as a whole and the way it develops. So this is a diagram that shows you the uh, advantages and drawbacks according to whether the fuel is a byproduct or an agricultural biomass. So if uh, it's a byproduct, and I'm talking about sawdust, uh, clearing wood, uh, or, or um, wood chips, forest wood chips, then you are looking at a circular economy. So for gas, uh, syn gas treatment, you've got a biomass that doesn't have any pollutants so far. Hydrogen is considered as a green hydrogen, a fully green hydrogen. So for the ICPE, well, you'll be in line with the 2910A. I'm not saying it's best, but as wood, as a, we're talking about a wood byproduct, it will be easy to uh, have it covered by the ICPE. So so ICP, which is an installation classified for environmental protection. Um, then you've got controlled pyrogasification technology. And if you have all of these aspects, uh, you'll have good social acceptance. So uh, if you depend on a primary sector, this is the drawback. And if the wood sector is reduced, there'll be less wood waste. So that will have an impact as well on the cost of the fuel. Oh, let's take another example. No, I was going to say something silly. No, let, let me move on to uh, farm biomass. So it's the same analysis here. So farm biomass. So we're going to be using plant waste to feed into the 
system. So the produ production system has to be controlled. It, it needs to be, to, uh, it, well, it's easy to treat uh, thin gas. It's going to be a full 100% uh, green hydrogen. Um, uh, it's an ICPE uh, classification system. So it's, uh, it protects the environment. And the, 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 the grain size distribution is controlled because we're, we're talking about using chips. And um, so it's a control pyrogasification technology and you're creating jobs as well. Now, drawbacks, the yield will depend on climate. So for dry summers, there will be less wood uh, waste. So what do you do? So you've got to plan ahead for any climate problems. So we've got the red two directives as uh, a disadvantage. So we're talking about uh, incineration. Uh, an incineration directive. So this is uh, something that can be um, a, a, a negative point for this kind of sector. But of course, the final texts have not yet been produced. Then there's the cost of the fuel that can depend on climate as well. So we can do the same thing now for installations that are fed with waste. So based on uh, Class B wood, today we consider that these projects uh, contribute to the circular economy because we're close to the production of wood uh, Class B. So it's transport by uh, boat uh, or in Southern Europe, uh, there are other forms of transport. So it's 100% biogenic. So class B has to be 100% biogenic. So that's an advantage. It's green. And the environmental impact is very advantageous compared with the current sectors that exist. So ACVs are simplified, for example. So drawbacks, uh, there are a few references for class B wood compared with uh, conventional biomass. So the ICP, uh, the environmental protection question, well, there's a question mark there. It's not very simple. And syn gas treatment is going to be more complex. So there will be a bigger capital expenditure. So, uh, so we're talking about CSR, a mixture of plastic and wood. So that's part of the circular economy. The cost of the fuel is uh, even more than the cost of Class B wood. It's very expensive. Uh, today, the, uh, it's uh, landfilled. Then you've got the question of a long distance export. It's 30% biogenic, nevertheless. It's considered, 30% is considered as green. And so the impact on the environment is also considered to be advantageous. It's like Class B wood. Now, for drawbacks, that there can be counter references in terms of gasification. And this is due to the variability of the system that's being used. So we're not sure about the ICPE, the environmental protection. Uh, and then the syngas treatment, it's going to be more complex. And the drawback is to control the quality. So it's important to be able to control the quality so there are no surprises at the end. So while we're waiting uh, for hydrogen to be developed for mobility projects, there, there are uh, many people thinking about alternative um, solutions. So you can use uh, internal combustion engines, for example. But for the moment, it's difficult to guarantee that an engine can be 100% hydrogen. It can be guaranteed at 50%, but we haven't got 100% uh, yet. But uh, the hydrogen can also be used in a PM a fuel cell. After that, there's the question of what to buy back price for what is being produced if, if, it, if you want to set it back to the network. There is, of course, the solution of self-consumption. Um, so, you know, as I said, there's the buyback price. And because in, in, in France we have a lot of nuclear power, um, it's not as good. Um, what about producing synthesized biomethane? 
because it's possible rather than uh, producing something that's not identified. So there you've got to have oxygen gasification. You've got to have a methanation uh, brick as part of your system. And there's a possible choice between electrolysis and the Watergate shift. But you can use electrolysis to enrich the gas to make hydrogen and produce the oxygen necessary for purifying the gas. However, what is the buyback price? Well, again, there is no buyback price uh, for synthesized biomethane because of the grid that we have. There are working groups uh, thinking about this, and I'm, I'm part of a working group. The idea is to promote the sector, and hopefully with experimenting contracts, we will be able to inject it and have a buyback price, or at least to have a call for projects that will allow us to ask for a buyback price. So that's the uh, sector for injecting biomethane, uh, biomethane from a waste uh, gasification. So, and you can see that there are many bricks that are shared and only methanation is going to be different. So we can imagine a fairly flexible project with hydrogen production, but also synthesized biomethane. So there we are. So what about the conclusions then? So the trends that are coming out from the first developments, what are they? So concerning technological readiness, there are no real references uh, of the, the whole chain. So there are no real references that really work, but um, that's not why there is no technological readiness, because each brick is at a commercial stage in its life. And the key to these projects are the management of the interface, is the management of the interfaces, how well the interfaces are managed. So the bricks are built in terms of capital expenditure. Well, nevertheless, we're looking at high, high, high investments there will be uh, an expected drop uh, within the next three years. So 15 to 20% over the next three years, that's the uh, level of the drop. So of course, uh, you know, these different uh, sectors are, are just emerging. It, it's all about uh, supply and demand. So that's uh, that will have an effect on, on the prices. So in terms of the operating expenditure, so it's important to look at the uh, treatment of the gas when you're reusing waste. It's important to think about that. And then there's the consumption, the compressors, the purifiers. Uh, they all require a lot of electricity. So you've got to be careful with that. Sometimes it, you can have an asset surprise. And then in order to obtain the right operating rate, you've got to have operators who are qualified and that's something that's difficult to find today on the market. So be careful in your business plans to really integrate the right people with the right qualifications for your project. Last but not least, let me end on a few positive outlooks. Currently in France, there are over 15 projects for producing hydrogen. They're all uh, under study at the current time. They've all been clearly identified. Um, potentially, I think there could be about 30, but there are 15 that have been very clearly identified. And it's also important to note that we have a certain amount of French expertise on the subject. Local authorities, for example, a lot of local authorities are ready to play the game, ready to play ball. Um, quite a few of the manufacturers have trans have changed their bus fleets, um, so they're ready to function with these solutions. Um, we have lots of manufacturers also now making products, building the different installations that will be used in the future. We have some very competent design and development offices. Um, and we have a lot of energy specialists and they're all here ready and willing to promote these kind of uh, energies, this kind of sector in the field. They can talk to the users, they can talk to companies such as GRDF, people such as Total also, who've just set up a business unit that is specialised in renewable gas or energy that has been on the sector and active for quite some time. 
Uh, basically, I would say that all the stars are aligned for us to see a certain takeoff of this kind of technology. So there you have it. I finished and I'd be delighted if any of you wish to contact me if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very detailed panora panoramic presentation. Let me now pass the floor straight away over to Christian from the society Af from the company Afner. Christian Bestien is going to explain to us what the Inocar projects are all about and the outlook for the future. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you also to Anthony for the presentation that he gave, giving a broad overview of the current situation for hy green hydrogen. Let me start out with a brief presentation now on the Inocar process. And prior to this, just a few words about Hafner Energy as a company. Chose de bizarre. Attendez, là. je ne comprends pas ce qui se passe. Je n'arrive pas. Je ne suis pas quite sure what's happening with my screen. I'm not able to move on to the next screen. Okay, it's working. So I always say that we are a startup, an energy transition startup, but we're a startup that is over 25 years old. Basically, we have over 25 years of experience in energy efficiency and biomass. For many, many years, for example, we've provided support to product managers to convert biomass into energy, mainly using standard combustion processes and also cogeneration processes. In 2015, we started to invest in InnoCal breakthrough technology and this is the technology that I'm going to talk about and this enables us to produce hydrogen using biomass. Now ours is a company that is based in Vitry-les-Francois and not in France. We have family shareholders and we have a few new shareholders who've joined us. They're bigger shareholders and they were previously shareholders in a company in, in Paris and the fact that they've joined um, Hafner shows they're interested in the um, in the hydrogen sector. So let's have a quick look now at the way in which we've been pioneers in terms of the energy efficiency solutions. These are a few sites that we've contributed to, either as project managers initially speaking, and more recently speaking as project managers in charge of supplying the equipment. I could go into detail on the last photo on the right hand side. This is a cogeneration plant, a biomass cogeneration plant that we've just commissioned in Amsterdam for AEB. And this is going to produce heat and electricity in the daytime using biomass mass. This is a project that um, where we were the turnkey solution provider. So as you can imagine, we have a certain amount of expertise in terms of project management um, through to the construction phase whereby we produce the energy. In addition to these references that you can see on the screen, we've also developed the Inukar process. We started developing it in 2015. This is where we invested in R&D. We then launched the Inukar process in 2018 and we signed our initial contracts in 2019 and these are now contracts that are being implemented and I'll refer back to these a bit later on. Anthony spoke to you about the different solutions that are out there for producing biomass, sorry not biomass for producing hydrogen and biomass um, we believe is an excellent source and excellent raw material for this. Why? Well basically because there's plenty of it available, it's available throughout France and elsewhere in the world and if we look at the amount of biomass that is produced by nature by the sun in France then we exceed 1000 terawatt hours a year. So this is more than the total amount of oil produced whatever the usage in France. So as you can see nature has a massive uh, production potential uh, for renewable energy. On top of that, biomass is pretty cheap. If we compare it with oil that we take from the source, we have an entrant cost that is pretty low. And if I use the example of forest wood, forest wood plates, these are products that are already quite elaborate. Um, the energy price or the energy cost amounts to around tw about 20 euros the megawatt hour. Of course, when you start using different types of waste, what we call CSR, the price is lower.
lower. You can you can even be paid money to collect this waste and recycle it. What's a massive advantage with biomass is that it's not intermittent. It doesn't depend on the climate, and it's easy to store and transport. The other thing is it's well and truly part of the circular economy because given the fact that um, you've got biomass throughout French land, um, we can we can we can collect it and use it at a local level or a national level. Let me now move on and present you a document that was published a few years ago by Solagro. This at the time was a study in which we were looking to see exactly how we could replace all of the natural gas that is distributed in the gas networks in France by 2050. And the three sectors that were evaluated for this were both methanization, also gasification, and also the power to gas solution. In other words, the conversion of electricity into gas that we then re-inject um, next into the gas networks. So as you can see, the potential is quite considerable and gasification has uh, a deserved place in most French regions in the western part of France. As you can see, there's more power to gas than one might expect. This is due to the presence of um, a lot of wind turbines present in this part of the country. Now, the Unicar uh, process is now focusing on this process so as to produce renewable hydrogen, of course, renewable because it's produced based on lignocellulosic biomass. We're not competing at all with methanization processes. Um, these are processes whereby one aims to use damp or wet entrants, whereas we use lignocellulosic raw material. The hydrogen is competitive because, as you've been able to see, if if you have a high conversion yield, then this makes it possible to obtain hydrogen with very competitive prices. And also, thanks to continuous operations of the continuous operation of the process, uh, we're not reliant on electricity or wind or the sun, for example. And as I've already said, this um, can be part and parcel of a circular economy without any problem whatsoever. What we look is to produce five kilos an hour approximately um, when it comes to uh, the hydrogen. What are the main arguments in favor of the production of hydrogen? Well, first of all, the aim is to have a solution that is 100% relevant in the different regions. What we want is to support the local forestry sectors. Very often, they're very interested in new solutions for getting rid of their residues. I would stress the importance here, as Anthony did, uh, of how important the residues are. No way are we going to start cutting down trees to be able to produce hydrogen. Basically, the Re the available residues are, am are ample to be able to provide everything we need for hydrogen in our local regions. The additional advantage of the advantages of the process is that we can produce continuously throughout the year with no impact on the elect electricity grid or a very limited impact on the electricity grid. The cost of producing the hydrogen thanks to these inner processes is completely decorrelated from the price of electricity and climate change. And and uh, the creation of a lot more jobs, locally speaking, jobs that can't be taken elsewhere, one for the production of hydrogen, but also for the upstream sector that would be responsible for collect, collecting and pr processing all of the biomass. So at the end of the day, where do our main Inoka innovations lie? Well, as I said, ours is a breakthrough technology that was fully developed by Afna Energies, protected by over 14 families of patent, patents at a national level, and the process works very, very well. As, as I described briefly earlier, what we do is transform using heat transform using heat, the biomass. We talk about thermolysis, thermal heating. And we, instead of breaking up the water molecules to extract the hydrogen and the oxygen separately, we break up the molecules of the biomass, particularly cellulosis, for example, C6X905, and we extract a fraction, a gas fraction. And we also extract the solid fraction that we called biochar. Now, in our process, there is no gasification, full gasification, and there is no air that is added to the first stage nor to the second stage that follows when we have the thermolysis vapor. We crack it over a thousand degrees. So the first process at around 
500 degrees produces char or biochar. Then it produces the thermolysis steam, and it's this steam that is then cracked um, because it doesn't have oxygen at over a thousand degrees under the temperature impact. The gas is once again uh, reduced, and at the output, uh, we have uh, an output made up for the most part of CO and made up of hydrogen as well. With a gas to water reaction, we then managed to maximize the hydrogen rate so that in what we call the hydro hypergas, we have a hydrogen rate that amounts to approximately 70%. And it's these very high rates of hydrogen that facilitate the extraction of the hydrogen and also the extraction in very economically viable conditions. The whole process does not involve any injection of air or oxygen, so no di dilution of the gas with nitrogen. The co-product from the biochar serves several purposes. First and foremost, as fuel, like coal, uh, very easily burnable, easy to transport and to store, but also, and this is the part that we think is the most interesting, at the end of the day, it's also a carbon sink. In other words, this specific type of biochar, if we give it back to the soil as such and use it in farming, it will gradually comprise a stock of CO2 that it can give off for hundreds of years. And so this enables us to produce a hydrogen that is not only green, but I would almost say that it's super green because given the fact that we return to the soil potentially the CO2 in the form of biochar, the global carbon uh, footprint of the whole process is negative. So if you drive with a hydrogen vehicle provided by Unocar, Unocar that works with Unocar fuel, it's a neutral fuel, but at the same time, same time, it's also going to reduce the amount of CO2 emissions from another vehicle that's still driving using diesel. So we have an impact on the environment that is quite considerable. Hence, um, this is uh, basically something important I want to say. I believe we could talk about super green hydrogen. The added advantage of this process is it gives you the opportunity to vary the hypergas production. Uh, you can use it for heat or electrical energy, or you can use it for hydrogen. In other words, given that you don't remove the hydrogen, we could easily valorize all of the hypergas produced into heating energy. And as a result, we can create a much better balance or at least contribute to um, reducing the amount of fossil fuels used before other energy sources are developed. Now, a standard Enocar station or site that I was talking about earlier looks like this. 750, sorry, 7,500 tons of biomass used, coming mainly from local forests. It produces approximately 1,500 tons of biochar, so a considerable carbon sink that can then be comprised for the whole sector, and also an excellent source of income because biochar is very sought after for its um, characteristics, and hence the process can then produce 250 tons of renewable hydrogen. For the syngas part of things, the hypergas, the optimization or the valorization will be done in different boilers. In this process, we can produce heating, um, we can produce methane gas that can be then can then be injected into the local heating networks. Currently, we have two projects that we've completed. The first one was at uh, Vitry Le Francois. This was a demonstrator project. Um, this was with Vitry Hydrogen. You can see the industrial pilot project in the photo. This has been up and running since 2019. This project received a great deal of financial support from the ADEM, the French Energies Agency, and this has enabled us to uh, receive some quite sizable grants as well for the rest of the project. This project also in particular enabled us to gather vital data on the typical size that we will need when we industrialize these units. So we're currently pursuing with the deployment, notably through the first industrial scale project. I'm going to talk to you about this. This is the one that we've put together with RGDS. They are renewable gas distributors and natural gas distributors uh, in the Strasbourg metropolis. And we're going to have a production unit that will be, be capable in the long run of producing 700 kilos of hydrogen 
other day. This is what it looks like. Uh, at least this is what the architecture, the architect has designed within the process of deploying this. And in the foreground, you can see the hydrogen station for distributing the hydrogen. Then in the middle, you've got all of the compression and storage and hydrogen distribution area. As you can see, it takes up quite a lot of room. Unfortunately, that's one of the constraints that gas distributed hydrogen imposes on us. Here, you've got the purple building. Um, this is where we produce the hydrogen. And then on the left-hand side, this is where we store all of the biomass. The project has been put together jointly with um, our ENR, the subsidiary within our GDS for renewable energies. Our GDS receives public funding from the city of Strasbourg, the Caisse des Dépôts and the company Engie. And what motivated them for this project was first and foremost, the decarbonation of um, all the products used in industry, basically, as we say, from the world from the world to the wheel. And what they wanted to do was create a circular economy uh, using local resources and guaranteeing that they were able to optimize the use of the local soils. This installation is now in place in Strasbourg. Um, in the long run, this station will produce over 700 kilos of renewable hydrogen. As, as you've seen, a lot of vehicles will be able to function using this type of fuel. Um, there will be a lot of um, vehicles that collect household waste in the local area that will be able to use it. And so a lot of work is being done to optimize all the different ways of using the hydrogen. This project is currently under completion. We're in the process of delivering all the different types of equipment. Um, and we have the first line of thermolysis and cracking that is going to be set in place. Obviously, there are several stages, as I described. Next, the qualification process and the testing process will take place. This will be during the course of 2021. We will then double and triple our production capacity regarding the syngas, and then we'll add the purification and extraction part for the hydrogen and the hydrogen distribution station for selling the hydrogen to vehicles. The most important part is what we're currently doing. This is the part that will enable us to demonstrate how well our process works, the inner car process, how efficient it is. So here you have just a few very recent snapshots taken this month. The first one on the left hand side shows you the introduction or the building of the first modules. The green one is for the thermolysis for the process. Next, um, you've got what we call the cracking module. This will enable to crack at very high temperatures. And both of these two modules will enable us to produce the hypergas equivalent to 240 kilos of um, product per day. Next, you can see what we're currently building. The test phases have already been scheduled to take place over the next few weeks. And these will enable us during the second quarter of this year to demonstrate both uh, how we can produce the hypergas based on the specs that we've already set out and deployed on a smaller scale, and also the production of biochar uh, equivalent to approximately 200 kilos of hydrogen per day. Our innovation has been rewarded um, and has also been talked about a great deal in the media. In fact, we've received several prizes, um, innovation prizes, for example, within the scope of the Polytech trade fair. Um, it was the first time as such that a hydrogen based pro product had been rewarded by the Polytech trade fair. So I think that's about it from me. Thank you very much for listening. I imagine you'll have a few questions and I hope that I'll be able to answer them. Merci Christian pour cette présentation. Et Thank you very much Christian for your presentation. And we'd like to congratulate Hafner for all the progress made. Um, and we hope that we're going to continue along the same lines. I'm sure you are. Yes, yes, we're working extremely hard, but it's true. I'm absolutely delighted because today is the first time we have the opportunity of showing something very tangible. It's true, our concept is um, it's uh, 
it's a very sexy concept. The feasibility studies have demonstrated that, yes, we're able to have not only um, renewable hydrogen, but highly competitive hydrogen price-wise. And we're convinced that over the next few years, it really will be possible to uh, have a hydrogen hydrogen price that is much much more competitive and also in certain cases we think it will be pretty much on a par with fossil based hydrogen and to produce renewable energies virtually at the cost of fossil fuels i think it's going to interest a lot of people yes absolutely it's very good and congratulations for all the progress that you've made now at this stage i'd like to pass the floor over to rolf from Quartus Energy based in Sweden. And they have a great deal of experience on this subject. They managed to synthesize, basically, using endurance. Now, I know he's going to go into detail on this. He'll give a far better explanation than I can. Um, Rolf will be talking about the direction they've headed in over recent years. And today they have an end result that it would seem is also extremely promising. So I'd now like to pass the floor over to, to Rolf. Rolf, the floor is yours. Thank you for, for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here and to be able to present our, our solution uh, forward from, from biomass to, to hydrogen. So we, we, we start with a, our plant in uh, Höganäs in Sweden. It's, um, well, a more than a thousand kilometers north from, from where, you, where most of you are. So uh, we are at the steel mill uh, with this first uh, it's plant for six, six megawatt syngas production. Um, it, it's really um, our, our company, um, I, I will uh, give you an introduction to our company, uh, our technology. Yeah, a little bit about the Herganus project and how how this uh, takes us uh, to to hydrogen in in a very in a very spectacular way, I would say. So, and um, let's go forward. Uh, our company is uh, I'm the founder of the company, and we started it's almost 15 years ago, and um, the idea was to uh, to uh, create a new tech uh, new gasification technology being more efficient than than the one uh, we we had before and so from from the beginning we we started at the um, um, university doing lab scale tests and then started with 150 kilo, kilowatt uh, gasifier together with an industrial gas company and uh, we moved forward with the first gasifier in 2011 uh, half a megawatt uh, and we we integrated this uh, to a complete plant within the next few years. Be, um, in in uh, in those years, we actually also tested like thirty different biomasses uh, for for uh, and gasify them. Um, everything in order to to stay competitive with a low cost biomass for for going forward. And the um, the. The next stage was to uh, engineer our first industrial plant in, in Sweden uh, and uh, in parallel uh, also in Japan and California. The construction started in 2018 and we are now in a position to start the plant and I will give you more on this. Uh, what we're working with um, is a combined plant for hydrogen CO2 production, uh, which we um, completed a pre-study in, in 2020 in, in France. Uh, we're working with SNG, uh, meaning synthetic natural gas uh, methanation uh, projects. Uh, in, uh, we have combined heat and power projects, uh, actually um, in, in California and, and also in France. Our um, our facilities uh, is Herganes is in the south of Sweden, and we are located in in Schista, just outside Stockholm. And our test plant is uh, one and a half hour west from from the Stockholm area. Today we are about thirty employees, half being uh, in Schista and half in the Herganes um, plant. Um, our technology is a three stage gasification. We start with a wet biomass, we dry it in an indirectly heated dryer, 
It's a big, uh, you can call it a tumble dryer. Uh, we heat with flue gases on the outside of a, of a drum and the drum has um, uh, inner tubes inside. So it's, it's more or less uh, a, rotating, um, uh, a rotating heat exchanger. Uh, we drive down the, the uh, uh, dryness below five, uh, well, below the humidity, I should say, below 5%. And, and then we go to the pyrolysis. The pyrolysis, we increase the temperature without any air, um, and we go up to about 400 degrees in a, in a similar rotating drum uh, reactor. And this is a slow pyrolysis, and we get lots of char from, from this, biochar. Um, we, we, and we get uh, pyrolysis gas. And what happens here is that the, the char is really more or less um, um, pure carbon, like elementary carbon. And the, 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 the pyrolysis gas we get holds all the tars and higher hydrocarbons. So uh, the, um, the pyrolysis gas we use for heating uh, the process and the char, we actually mill to very fine powder uh, like uh, below 100 microns. And then we, we go to the gasification where we indirectly heat uh, gasifier to 1100 degrees, meaning that um, we don't mix uh, the actual process uh, flow of um, the char and steam that we generate um, with, with the heating media. So it's, it's pure radiation that heats uh, the, the actual gasifier. And that means that we in, a, in an isothermal reactor can, can take the char uh, to a complete conversion to gas. And, and this is really unique for, for our process. The 1100 degrees hot gas goes out to a gas cooler and it's cooled down, it's filtered, it's compressed and, and then used downstream. But being energy efficient, we, we also need to take care of the flue gases. So what happens is that the flue gases from, from the radiation tube burners we use in, for heating the gasifier. We take the flue gases, we let them heat the pyrolysis reactor, and after heating the pyrolysis reactor, they heat the dryer. And in, in this way, we can be extremely energy efficient in, in, in the processing from from wet biomass to pure pure energy gas or syngas, as, as we usually say. Uh, as I mentioned, about 30 different biomasses uh, we have tested in our test plant. Um, we qualified three, um, um, three biomasses for our um, installation in Herganes, and that, that was uh, normal wood chips, it was bark, it was uh, forest residues, all, all three, and, and uh, all of those were also mixed uh, for, for the purpose of being cost efficient. Um, as you see, it's wood, it's crops, it's industrial waste that, that we have tested. Uh, and when it comes to lab testers, we have more than 300 different um, um, uh, biomasses or potential fuels for gasification, I should say, um, that we have tested. And the, the, the issue with this is understanding the dynamics of, of the drying uh, of the pyrolysis and get the character, uh, characteristics for that, and also see that the the ability to, to uh, get a complete conversion and a full reaction in, in uh, 1100 degrees gasification. And this, this we have for um, as, as a backbone of our, our business. The, the actual outcome of this is, as I said, using the, the uh, ex, um, excess heat and for, for the pyrolysis and dryer, we can actually operate in a very, very efficient way, meaning that 80% of the energy in the incoming biomass is actually in the outgoing uh, syngas that uh, we, we produce. And this uh, puts us also um, in, in a unique position. We, we have um, a strong patent portfolio for the gasification process, for high hydrogen process, which I, I will um, give you more on. Um, uh, indirectly heated gasifier as it's set up here, the steam char injection technology that we use uh, we also, for steel industry, uh, we have a particular bio-coking process uh, where we can actually tailor-made a bio-coke for substituting um, metallurgical coke. 
And we also have uh, like a hydrocarbon uh, process where we, we, we do this very differently in a different manner, but we use the pyrolysis gas as, as the end product and hydrogen for hydrogenation of that. But that, that, that is a new thing. And so what, what, what is it we're doing? Bridging the gap from low grade biomass to industry and transport requirements. The interesting about this is um, it's fossil, uh, fossil CO2 that the industry wants to get rid of. Uh, and we can substitute their energy gas to hydrogen to bio coke, especially when it comes to, to steel and mineral industry. Uh, when it comes to renewable transport fuels, uh, it's uh, the methane and onwards. It's, it's more or less a matter of scale and maturity for, for the technology in this, this downstream area. And, and of course, uh, we try uh, with our first installations to use um, the, the programs and, and uh, um, financial support for getting, getting this to happen. Uh, the, the, the syngas we produce is hydrogen rich. Uh, it's 58% hydrogen, but 29% of uh, carbon monoxide, a few percent of methane and the rest being carbon dioxide. This, this takes us to something that is more or less a chemical copy of um, um, a steam reformed natural gas. So you, you will see something uh, quite similar uh, for that. We have a very big goal for, for ourselves and we hope that we, we can uh, help the industry and transport sector to eliminate a million of uh, tons per year by 2030 with this, with this new technology platform. This is just an example of uh, how the uh, syngas composition looks like uh, in our, our gasifier in, in Haganas. Um, and this, I, I mentioned Haganas project and it's important for us. It's the first industrial one. Um, the the um, six megawatt plant uh, is uh, the syngas delivered, meaning seven and a half uh, megawatt or one and a half dry ton per hour or two and a half wet tons per hour. Now I'm confusing you and, and probably the inter interpreter as well. I'm sorry for that. Uh, we have a 20 year offtake agreement with Herganus AB. Herganus AB is a, a um, iron powder producer. And uh, the, the, um, the res result is uh, 10,000 tons per year of CO2 reduction at their plant. And the next thing uh, is uh, when this first stage is uh, sta stabilized in, in production, we have an expansion possibility uh, for another, at least another 20 megawatt here. Uh, well, Hergenus uh, is, is an old uh, producer of metal powders, uh, especially iron powders. And, and uh, th this uh, is an international company. It's an old company, well, well known in, in, uh, in, in Sweden. We have also some product partners and sponsors um, do you I, I suppose uh, ABB is the is the one you know of uh, Södra uh, and Svea Skog are um, biomass suppliers uh, SSAB is steel, another steel company uh, Swedbank Almi and Energimedieten is financers Calderis is uh, the the um, um, ceramic insulation material for the gasifier uh, so it's it's really about we have full syngas quality produced from start. Uh, we have tested this in in the furnaces at Haganes, uh, and we have uh, unfortunately seen that in our upscaling we have some some issues with dusting in in, uh, in our pyrolysis gas. So what are we doing? We we realized that here we need to do something, and what what we're doing is we are adding some. Uh, some hot uh, cyclones. The, the thing about pyrolysis gas is that it's condensable, and it means that we have to uh, we have to treat it hot. And uh, for that, we have we are uh, installing some hot cyclones in this uh, new new part of the site in order to start this up um, within the next month. What happens is we have been doing some daytime operation for Haganas for the furnace commissioning, the, the first tests um, recently. 
we are adding the cyclones, uh, we will have our um, milestone three, meaning seven days consecutive operation. Uh, um, and we start the demonstration uh, this summer um, for, for, for this, uh, what we call milestone four, and then start of syngas delivery by the end of, of the year on a continuous basis for the coming 20 years, I should say also. Uh, we think that uh, our technology fits very well into the steel industry for the demand of energy gases, uh, whether it's syngas as it is or methane, uh, it feel, fits well into the demand of hydrogen in, uh, in an industrial scale for the reduction furnaces uh, and also for, for the bio coking, uh, bio coke need that, that, that they have. So we, we, are, we are pretty much working with, the, with this as our basis of customers. What, what we have done is also um, SNG standing for synthetic natural gas, methane or biogas. Um, uh, uh, there, there are several names for this, but we, we did in, uh, well, uh, in May 2018 uh, at our test plant, we did um, um, the, full, um, the full supply line from, from our gasification, gas conditioning, the catalytic processing, uh, the methane separation, and also a dispenser, and that drove one of our um, CNG cars uh, with, with the gas produced. And th this, this is really to show that, that it can be done. Um, but that's, that's really the pr proof of the pudding, so to say. Um, the, the actual thing about starting with as much as 60% of hydrogen is that uh, you, you can do a lot more. Uh, so what we what we see is that uh, converting um, in in our processing, uh, sixty percent uh, of the syngas comes out as as hydrogen means that it's it's easy to get a very high um, yield of hydrogen, and if you if you notice here the actual hydrogen is more than it is within uh, within the biomass from the beginning, and. Uh, why, why is that? It's of course because we use um, steam uh, for, for the gasifier and, and steam uh, is par part of the, um, well, the hydrogen from the steam is part of the, the, the product in the end. So how does this come? Well, in, in, in this picture, uh, we want to show the traditional uh, hydrogen one one pass uh, through a water gas shift and a PSA process. And, and doing so um, means that um, you, you can get a certain level of uh, hydrogen produced. What, we, what, what I told you was also that we have like 30% of CO. We want to, to convert that CO to hydrogen and, and CO2, the CO2 being separated, of course. Uh, and um, the, uh, what 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 we have is um, is a two stage process, and and with the first um, with the first um, hydrogen separation before we go to the water gas shift and and then do a final separation. The point in this is from a chemical from a chemical reaction point of view, we by by separating the the the, the bulk of hydrogen coming with the syngas from the beginning. We can we can drive the CO down to a very low level in, in, in a two-stage water gas shift and get the complete conversion of the combustibles to, to hydrogen in the process. And this is um, the unique position we have we have in, in uh, biomass to hydrogen. So what do we see forward? Well, in we see um, we see um, a prosperous future, and the, the the wonderful thing when you work with with uh, natural material is that when when you have uh, syngas like uh, the syngas um, composition we have, which is also a very clean syngas, you can you can use that in a catalytic upgrade to to biogas, SNG, RNG, methanation, as 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 we mentioned. And, and I, sh I showed you we did like two years ago, um, but you can also uh, do it for liquid fuels, alcohols, um, methanol, 
um, uh, ammonia, uh, whatever. It's it, it's it's really the, there is a whole world of chemistry based upon syngas, which is very very uh, well established. Not necessarily in in the size that that the biomass gasification is today, but but the technology is there. The other part is of course the hydrogen. Hydrogen being, uh, as mentioned before, an energy carrier um, and, and a fuel, and it's also um, a, a raw material. But the, the, the interesting concept that we, for instance, in, in, in the in pre-feasibility started with it last year, we also see that the green carbon dioxide can actually be a, a product in this. And it's a, it's a pure uh, natural born material and, and it, it has, it has a better price as a product than than the CO two emissions uh, to um, to be substituted uh, if if used for that purpose. Uh, we we also see several ways forward with with uh, the the combinations of this and uh, the the thought of having a, a biorefinery is is always there to 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 us. So. Uh, we see that we can have gaseous products, we can have liquid products, we can have um, even solid products from, from this technology platform. And, and this, this is really a unique uh, proposition. So syngas as such, uh, the, uh, the RNG, the biogas, or the hydrogen, and even uh, with the twist of uh, producing some solid bio coke as a, as a byproduct in this. Um, the the performance in this is is also really really good. Um, of course, um, the processing uh, is in in several steps, and uh, it I mean in, as in all um, technology, the the uh, the investment has to pay um, has to pay off. Uh, but we we see a really good um, prospect when it comes to to, to hydrogen. It's really, it can really be uh, competitive. Excuse me, Rolf, it's Paul here. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Would right. you be able maybe to, to conclude quite soon? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I will. Uh, so I, very, very quickly. Yes. So the, the next step for us is to, to build a bigger plant, like 20 megawatts uh, for, for coming projects. And uh, we have uh, the the um, the Hagenas project, uh, the, the next coming activities, uh, the growth plan, and 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 I will see all, all of all of this and hydrogen especially uh, lies in this for us and and the, the partners uh, going forward. Um, uh, so, question is, where do you want to go? And uh, last, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Merci à toi, Rolf. Hey, Excusez-moi pour t'avoir fait avancer. Thank you, Rolf. Sorry, I, I, I hurried you up there towards the end. So, of course, this is a subject that is very interesting. But we're not going to be able to stick to the time of one o'clock to finish. So, we'll try and finish at 1.15. So that means saying an extra quarter hour uh, to, to make the most of all of the different uh, experiences. So I'm now going to invite Jean Freyd from Carlos Energy. He's going to uh, speak, Jean Freyer, sorry. He's going to talk about a project that he's developing. So using hemp to produce green hydrogen. You have the floor, Jean. Yes, hello, everybody. Normally, you should be able to see my screen. Yes, that's fine. Great. Please just stick to 15 minutes. OK. So thank you for giving me the floor. We've already heard uh, about different sources of biomass for producing green energy. We've talked about uh, uh, the different things this morning. I'm going to present to you a method developed by um, Keros Energy to produce green energy. 
So we started with an observation. So we were created following this observation. First of all, an agricultural observation. Agriculture has to rise to the challenges linked to climate change. Agriculture is the source of, of different emissions. In France, it's the third uh, biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. So we need to be involved in the energy transition. We need to consume better and uh, emit less CO2. So there are different plans, national, European and worldwide plans that all focus on doing this. And there are also changes being made to forms of mobility. We're moving from all uh, petrol to more alternative fuels. Gas, gas is also appearing in uh, eternal combustion engines. And electricity is also appearing in uh, generators. So we need alternatives to uh, the usual fuels in cars. So this is what we're seeing across the world. And to this can be added a need, a need, a societal need to see a circular economy emerging. So this is something that we've seen most spectacularly over the last year. So this is something that can be done from an energy point of view as well. So the solution proposed by Keros Energy is really to use energy from agroecology as part of a circular economy. So there are farmers, there are farmers who so they've got the hectares of, of, of farmland and they work on an agroecological model. And part of that model can feed our uh, uh, Keras Energy production units. They transform farming biomass into clean, local, uh, cheap energy. So energy, but also CO2 uh, that can be used uh, for other activities. So it's an agro uh, quality CO2, there's also hydrogen and uh, methane, and all of this is in uh, as part of a circular economy. So at Keras Energy, we're interested in using hemp. Hemp is a product. It's a very advantageous uh, product. It's been around for millions and millions of years. And in fact, it, it's a CO2 trap. It's a plant that allows us to clean the earth. So it's a trap because it, uh, it, it captures three times more CO2 than a hectare of forest, uh, in the sense that a forest captures 15 tons a year of CO2, whereas for hemp, it's just three months that it needs to capture the same amount. So the, so, we're talking about 15 tons of CO2 being captured. It, it's captured. It grows a fiber very quickly. And that fiber acts as a biodiversity uh, reservoir. So it's the CO2, the sun, and photosynthesis that allows the plant to grow, and not water from the ground. In fact, we need very little water for hemp. We're not very dependent on uh, seasons. It's, it's more sun that is important. It's not like corn. Uh, two to three times less water is, lead, is needed to have the right kind of yield from hemp. And, and it's also an agroecological um, agro, agro product in the sense that the crop actually restructures the, the, the soil. It helps uh, the soil for future crops. It helps the soil to drain naturally. It means that uh, two years on the trot, no chemical products are needed because it doesn't like glyco, 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 
glycophosphates and other chemical products. So this uh, means that yields are improved and there's no uh, agrarian crop uh, competition either because it's really part of a crop cycle that the hemp is used. So you can have a spring crop that leaves the soil nice and clean, for example, and that encourages a depollution of the water table by absorbing nitrates and heavy metals that are present in the soil. So this uh, crop, we're not, we don't use the whole crop. In fact, the objective is not to take all of the plants. What we're interested in in hemp, and, and the rest is, is used uh, in a different way. So we use the organic material. We have a process, a pyrogasification process. And as An Anthony was saying, we just use uh, mature technological bricks. So that's our added value. We use a hemp with existing technology and we prepare the material, we dry it, we gasify it, and then we transform the syngas produced into different products. So we can have uh, agro food CO2, liquid CO2, hydrogen, syn methane that's reinjected into the gas network, uh, GRDF, that's uh, the primary industrial site that is concerned, and then a residual heat that can be used uh, on the production site. So it's the kerosene energy uh, process that produces that. The residue uh, is more of a mineral residue. We don't have any carbon residue. And this residue is, is used, well, the composition is used to enrich composts. So we use it to produce a mineral fertilizer. And this is all part of the circular economy. So it's within a radius of 30 kilometers around the site. So this first production site will be up and running in the next weeks. We'll be able to start to produce. Uh, well, we've got to set up the unit first, and then we'll be able to start producing. So it's in the Le Mans area. So why Le Mans? Well, because it's an important road uh, intersection. So, it, and it's also important from the railway transport as well. And there are gas pipes that go via Le Mans. So it's an important metropolitan area. It's a metropolitan area that's also very active when it comes to energy transition. So the mayor, the, the person in charge of the Metropolitan Authority, Stéphane Mathol, is also president of the Metropolitan Cluster Le Mansart, it's called, and they have some very big ambitions, and that's uh, the, what our project is part of. It's part of these ambitions. So we've got climate plans in the area. Keras Energy is as a project that was chosen as part uh, of the regional and in the regional industry uh, program. So we were given an ex a waiver, a derogation for using a synthesized uh, gas. So we are currently being very, very busy. We've completed all of the different administrative stages and now we're working with different departments uh, state departments and uh, grdf the idea being to set up the process the keras energy process as part of a circular economy so this is um what i was saying so uh, agriculture it's it's the farms within the 35 uh, kilometer radius that are going to be using the products and and they will so it's called the whole area is called eco h2 le mansart sorry i i tried to speed things up there a bit so that we could stick to the timing so i'll hand over to paul and i'd like to thank you for your availability and i'm happy to provide any further explanations if necessary.
Oui, merci. Uh, merci. Uh, Thank Jean. you. Thank you very much, Jean, for this presentation, for a very brief presentation. Thank you for having made the effort to shorten it. Um, we, we received a very clear explanation as to the project that you're currently implementing. Once again, I do apologize. Um, we still have 140 people present with us taking part. So this indicates that there's a great deal of interest in the subject that we're focusing on. So we are going to take the time to have the question and answer sessions. Um, we'll make sure that this doesn't take up more than 20 minutes in total. So let me now pass the floor without further ado over to Marco. Marco, Marco Minotti. Marco is going to explain to us the other possibility that we have for optimizing biomass, but also this time gas-based biomass, biomethane. And there's one subtle aspect in the work that Marco does that makes it possible to optimize growth or raw, uh, raw biomass. So Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, good, uh, good morning to all of you. I hope to keep you awake before lunch, so I'll try to share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see it. And um, so again, as uh, Paul said, my name is Marco Binotti. I am a researcher at uh, Politecnico di Milano, Italy. And I will present today um, the work performed within the Bionico project, uh, which is uh, related to the green hydrogen production from biogas with catalytic membrane reactor. So I think we perfectly fit in, in this uh, uh, conversation of today. So here is the outline of my presentation, but I want to start immediately. Uh, this is just an introduction. So we already know, uh, staying at, at this uh, nice conference that uh, the overall amount of hydrogen required is increasing, but most of the hydrogen produced today is uh, uh, not produced from renewables. 96% is the overall amount of hydrogen, which is actually coming from fossil fuels. We, we have just a four tiny percent, which is coming from electrolysis, uh, hopefully from renewables. So um, the fuel cell joint undertaking as identified, which is, a, let's say, an European um, uh, joint venture, has identified uh, six most promising pathways for green hydrogen production, which you can see in this slide. So these are all the possibilities you have, but in the end, uh, if we apply some cost and technology readiness level filters, then we just obtain six, which are most likely to be exploited in the near future. And among these, we have the biogas steam methane reforming. So exactly uh, to perform biogas steam methane reforming, we have developed the Bionico project, uh, which has the goal to produce hydrogen directly from biogas. So here you can see the information about the project, which started in 2015 and ended uh, um, about one year and a half ago. And here is the consortium uh, led by Politecnico di Milano. So what is the overview of the project? Basically, the goal was uh, to uh, design and develop an overreactor reactor in order to produce 100 kilograms of hydrogen per day from biogas, uh, based on a new concept, uh, which integrates the production and the purification of hydrogen in a single unit. This new concept is, uh, let's say, the catalytic membrane reactor, in which the membranes are separating uh, the hydrogen produced in the reactor itself. Uh, another goal was to check that this system was flexible uh, with different type of biogases. Finally, um, the, the objective was to have uh, the demonstration of an efficient biogas to hydrogen conversion system. So here is something we have already spoken about. If we have biogas and we want to produce hydrogen, uh, let me get a pointer here. Uh, we have, a, let's say, a conventional route, which uh, requires us to operate at 800 degrees C to have a reforming, then high temperature water gas ship reactor, low temperature water gas ship reactor, and the purification step, maybe based on PSA. So we check the efficiency of this type of system and we can achieve 52%. Uh, 
according to our simulations. Uh, the option here is to have just a single reactor which operates at lower temperature, around 500 degrees C, and allows achieving higher efficiency. The target of the project was 70%. So here you can see basically the work structure of our project with the different partners in the different uh, tasks which wanted to, uh, let's say, start from the components, for example, membrane and catalyst, and to get to a, a testing reactor supported by life cycle assessment, safety analysis, and modeling simulations. So let me spend one more word again on the catalytic membrane reactor concept. The idea, as already said, is to combine reaction and separation in a single unit, achieving what is called process intensification. Process intensification is good because it allows us to have less reactors and, and thus hopefully lower costs. And the advantages uh, are also related to the thermodynamic because if we are performing the separation together with the hydrogen production, thanks to the shift effect, which is based on the Le Chatelier principle, if we are removing products from, uh, let's say, the, the vessel, at the same time, we are pushing the reaction towards more hydrogen production. Uh, this is possible thanks to the use of membranes. In particular, in our case, the uh, set of reactions which were, are performed within the reactor are the oxidation to sustain the reaction uh, because it's an endothermic reaction, the reforming and the water gas shift, which are always occurring together within this, which is a sketch of this uh, um, membrane reactor in which you have vertical membranes, which are immersed in a fluidized bed of catalyst. So you can see here in the left-hand side, a plot in which we have the conventional limit thermodynamic limit of conversion, which can be overcome by using the catalytic membrane reactor in which, as I said, we are separating on one side of the membrane, pure hydrogen. So the project uh, um, developed uh, different components. The first one was the catalyst that needed to operate at lower temperature with respect to, uh, let's say, standard reforming and to operate in fluidized bed regime. Moreover, it was necessary to uh, be resistance, resistant to coke formation. With respect to conventional reforming, we have a higher uh, concentration of uh, CO2 because uh, syngas, uh, sorry, the biogas is rich of CO2. For this reason, coke formation was important. Finally, we, uh, Johnson Mate, which developed the catalyst, managed to produce 32 kilograms of catalyst for uh, the a pilot uh, plant uh, able to withstand coke and fluidized bed regime condition. Another uh, significant step forward was made on the membrane side. So the membrane are, let's say, the core of these reactors because they allow to uh, separate the hydrogen which is produced. So here you can see on the left hand side the membranes before Bionico and the uh, membranes after Bionico. You can see that the scale. Of the, of the membranes has changed. We had 20 centimeters membranes. We are now at 50 centimeters membranes. And also the shape and let's say the, the end of the membranes was changed. The goal was to improve, uh, uh, let's say, reduce the leakages within this membrane to improve hydrogen purity. This was the main goal. Moreover, I, I want to stress the fact that uh, before this project, we had really uh, lab scale production of membrane. And now we are close to, let's say, an industrialization of the project. So here you can see all the membranes inserted within the pilot uh, uh, reactor. This is just the top uh, flange with all the membranes coming down. And the, here are the characteristics of these membranes, which are showing good uh, characteristics in terms of selectivity and in terms of nitrogen leakage. Moreover, of course, uh, there was a testing activity which was performed uh, at the technic uh, Technical University of Eindhoven. Here you can see some of the results. Uh, the lab scale activity was useful to, let's say, demonstrate the concept and also to understand better how uh, the membrane reactor operates, its thermodynamic, and basically it was, was useful to develop uh, phenomenological models to describe the reactor. Finally, we achieved the hydrogen recovery up to 56% and purity up to 
65%, which is quite good. And then the modeling activity, which supported all the uh, project, basically studied the use of the membrane reactor within a complete system and checked the performance as function of the different operating parameters against conventional system. So here are the results. Uh, if we look at the system efficiency, uh, here you have different type of biogas, landfill and anaerobic digestion biogas. We can achieve efficiencies, let's say at 20 bar, which are in the range of uh, 65, 66%. Uh, the, the efficiency is even uh, uh, beyond 70% if you look at, uh, let's say, hydrogen produced at ambient pressure. And uh, uh, so this uh, uh, simulation work was important and allowed us also to estimate a levelized cost of hydrogen, so a cost of hydrogen reduction of about 7%. It's a, it's a tiny number, of course, but it's just uh, a number based on the first preliminary estimates we uh, performed. And here is, I think, the, the most important part of the project. We managed to build a, a reactor able to produce 100 kilograms per day, including 125 membranes. This is the largest biogas to hydrogen membrane reactor uh, ever built in the world. And um, unfortunately, the, uh, here, uh, by the way, you have a nice uh, uh, video in this link, which shows you all the phases of the construction. And uh, um, the testing was, let's say, the uh, Achilles heel of this project because the test was quite limited due to a failure that occurred in the system. It was actually a failure not related to the reactor uh, itself, but to, to, to the control system, to the electric system, which in the end damaged the reactor. So the testing activity was really limited. We did not manage to achieve the operating condition. But in any case, we managed to produce a, a highly pure hydrogen. Uh, the, the missing step, as I said, was uh, a further testing in a real biogas plant and as it was uh, initially uh, decided in the project. So here to summarize uh, the project results, we, we have developed new components for catalytic membrane reactors for hydrogen production from biogas. So new catalyst, new membranes. We have gained a lot of knowledge on how to uh, build these type of reactors and how to model them. And we also successfully design and, and, uh, and manufacture a, a catalytic membrane reactor of a very large size. Unfortunately, the testing activity was quite limited. limited. Moving to the numbers, well, we have an efficiency that can achieve uh, over 72% according to our simulation, which is uh, much higher than the 52% obtained with conventional methods. And we have uh, a reduced uh, levelized cost of hydrogen of about four euro per kilograms. Also the hydrogen purity is uh, quite high. So the project was a key step forward for the catalytic membrane reactor technology. And uh, we are here, here providing a new upgrading technology, thinking about directly operating uh, the biogas, not to biomethane, but directly to hydrogen. So uh, here is just a, a number which says that if we uh, convert 10% of the European biogas with the, the Bionico technology, we would be able to uh, cover about all the hydrogen demand for fuel cell electric vehicles in 2030, according to the forecast. Uh, as already underlined, the um, uh, the weak point of the project was the testing activity, but luckily we have another project which has started about one year and a half ago, which is called the MacBet project, which has the goal of putting together the knowledge on a catalytic membrane reactor for four different technological applications. One of these is hydrogen production from biogas. So in, within this project, we will test for about 4,000 hours each of the different uh, catalytic membrane reactors for the different uh, uh, application. The goal is again to reduce the greenhouse gas emission and to increase the efficiency up to 70% as already uh, verified within Bionico. Here is the uh, consortium of the new MacBet project. Uh, Evonik is the coordinator, but there are many companies, Engie, for example, from France, 
um, uh, which are pushing forward this technology, which in my opinion, thanks to Bionico, has come very close to commercialization. And here you can find all the links to the two projects and uh, of course uh, to my research group. Um, I thank you for the, uh, the attention and uh, just uh, to add a comment uh, on the, the question of Amandine, uh, the project uh, uses a, a fluidized bed reactor. So it means that the particle of catalyst uh, are uh, fluidized as it is shown in this uh, uh, slide here. So it's a fluidized bed, which allows to uh, overcome problems related to temperature control, to reduce the pressure drops, and also to overcome concentration polarization issues. So this was uh, everything from my side, and I will be glad to answer to any question if you have any. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Marco. Vraiment uh, très